Welcome back everyone. Today we are going to be talking about competitive analysis in food product development. And this is a fun topic. Honestly, I can't stress enough how in if you are wanting to be in product development or product innovation, you really want to be out there doing competitive analysis all the time. I have a teenage daughter and she hates going grocery shopping with me. Why? Because I am constantly doing competitive analysis and part of it is just the intellectual curiosity that I have for the field. Part of it is that I help out a lot of different small businesses across um, southern Ontario and across Canada and I just like to know what the different products are out there and so I, I stroll up and down the aisles of the grocery store and really immerse myself in looking at all of the information that's out there. I ha I ha actually have been kicked out of grocery stores because I've been strolling and snooping around and uh, taking photographs too long and not actually uh, making sales. Um, I happen to have some grocery store owners that know me and uh, uh, realize that I have a clear intent for what I'm doing and so they know when I walk into the store that I may be involved in doing some competitive analysis work and they don't mind but it's a ton of fun and honestly I just I can't stress enough how important it is and at the same time there's not a really set rule book and so you don't have to be overstressed that you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong you just need to go out and do it and do it with some sort of methodology in mind so let's dig into some of that methodology so that you can do it too so at the end of this video you'll be able to justify the role of competitive analysis as an essential part of product development and you'll uh, define some primary techniques in competitive analysis including understanding the features and benefits of competitive products understanding marketing and product positioning comparing manufactured suggested retail prices comparing ingredient and process technology and identifying market saturation and You'll perform some of these tasks on an example product. Hey, guess what? We will actually go about doing it. Normally, for those of you who are following along the course in Niagara College, we would be trying to set up a field trip at this point in time. And unfortunately, with COVID, going on field trips, especially to go to a grocery retailer right now, is a bit difficult because the um, expectations in grocery retail right now are that customers are going in and out as quickly as possible and not lingering within the store. So... There are also all sorts of different techniques that you can do online. And when you are out grocery shopping yourself, now you'll have a recognition of what's possible. I highly encourage you to do it. So, oh, so what is competitive analysis? There's our friend Tiny, and he is going to do some competitive analysis with us today on uh, ice cream sandwiches. But uh, it really is a quantitative and qualitative review of what your competition is doing in the marketplace. And it's helping you identify where some key opportunities are for taking the market. As as uh, Doug Hall has said many times, if you can't be unique, be cheap. And so in some cases, it's all about identifying those blue ocean spaces in between where you can capitalize on new opportunity. And in other cases, it can help you identify who your, um, who your consumer is and hone in on um, what their behaviors and values are so that if you are focusing on that blue ocean space, you, you're, you're, you're capturing their values. And if not, you're focusing on what are the sorts of cost cutting measures that are appropriate for the types of consumers that are purchasing this product. You'll want to understand the positioning within the store and the retail format and, and within the different categories within the grocery store. Um, I know uh, those of you who are in the course, I shared with you some resources on category management this week and shared some videos from our friend Peter Chapman at Skew Food on uh, understanding how to work with category managers for placing your product. But you'll want to know what category your product belongs to and understand the sort of dynamics within that category uh, when it comes to that first customer who is actually the retailer, you need to sell that product to the retailer first, who is then going to sell it to your customer. You need to understand both of those customer relationships as unique opportunities. So what else is it? You've got to really hone in on what that price structure is. I can't stress this enough. And we did some, we did some content previously on 
uh, defining pricing strategy for food products. And one of the key features is you will notice in most grocery retailers, they will have a very clear band of prices that are acceptable for their product. And you really can't go outside of that band when you're coming in as a new entrant. And it's rare that uh, products are able to justify pushing beyond the upper limit of that pricing structure. Um, you've got to have some really clearly differentiated features and benefits if you're going to exceed that price structure. And so that's where you've got to be creative in how you're marketing and um, branding that product to be able to justify it. You can get a lot of intel on ingredients as well. You can uh, oftentimes, I recommend when doing competitive analysis, buy a whole pot of product and uh, take it apart. You can see a lot of the um, information from reading the ingredient declaration. Uh, those of you who are students with me know how much I love to read ingredient decks and ask the question, why is this ingredient in here and what uh, what contribution to um, the structure and function of this product is each of those ingredients doing? It, you can also find out a lot about manufacturing and packaging technologies by uh, looking at the packaging um, materials, looking at the uh, machining marks on the food itself. You can see how different products were cut or portioned. Um, you can weigh the product and see the sorts of variances that are acceptable within that product. You can, in some cases, uh, take it apart piece by piece and figure out what the components are. How much, uh, if you're making an ice cream sandwich, how much of it is cookie? How much of it is chocolate? How much of it is inclusion? How much of it is ice cream? And you can piece together the, the structure from your competition by really honing in on each of the individual components. So that competitive analysis can be a lot of fun and it can be a, uh, almost a, a detective sleuthing activity, like being Sherlock Holmes of, of ice cream sandwiches, if you want to put it that way. So you do collect a lot of qualitative and quantitative data in, in competitive analysis. You can figure out who is your market, who's your demographic, who's your retail target. Not all products belong in every retailer. So in some cases, products belong in discount retailers because they're low price point and people who are shopping in discount retailers often are very uh, conservative about their, the pricing that they want to see on their products. So they're willing to put up with um, some other loss of uh, benefits, perhaps, uh, for example, um, inclusion of shelf life enhancing ingredients will reduce the price because you have less turnover on that product. Um, if you're positioning a product in a high-end retailer, you may be able to get away with other things, but you can't get away with cheap ingredients or um, technical ingredients that read poorly. Um, so you need to really hone in on who your demographic is and what your retail target is so that you can understand that. You've got to figure out what's in that space already so that you are creating a clear opportunity. Anytime you're positioning a new product into a grocery retail, you are displacing something else. So you've got to be able to um, clearly uh, put that proposition out there that it's worth displacing because there's going to be value both to the retailer as well as the customer. That retailer, that retailer wants to make their profit and they're the first line that you need to clear with this with. You're not selling to the consumer, you are selling to the retailer first. You got to have clear features and benefits and, and blue ocean opportunity in there. You want to do that price evaluation, ingredient evaluation and the feasibility on the manufacturer because I can't, I can't stress this enough how many uh, entrepreneurs come to me and say, oh, I've got this wonderful idea, but we see saturation within the marketplace. Perhaps there's 10 competitors who are doing very similar products and there's not a clear features benefits for their product as compared to all of the products that are in the marketplace. And in some cases, you're, that substitution doesn't make sense within the context of consumer behaviors. Another piece of that, uh, as I mentioned before, that price evaluation and ingredient evaluation, uh, cost and feasibility, honestly, um, when doing competitive analysis, you, you can look at the ingredient deck and the more experience you have in this industry, you look at that ingredient deck and you know exactly how it was made. And there are, there are some uh, folks out there, I'm friends with many of them, um, some people consider me one of them, where we just look at the ingredient deck and we, we, can, we can visualize instantly the process flow from that ingredient declaration. It takes practice and so this is why going out and doing 
competitive analysis just for fun is something that pro good product developers should be doing all the time. So first and foremost, you really should be going shopping. I would love to be able to take you guys out on a field trip. And right now the rigmarole for being able to do that and getting the both the permissions from uh, Niagara College as well as permissions from different retailers with uh, with permissions from public health just doesn't make sense. We're not in a we're not in a private enterprise where access is controlled. The general public is in there and they really need the general public in there and moving efficiently. So having us just uh, wandering around gawking uh, doesn't make sense at this point. But if you were going shopping, you'd be going in and buying all the competitors' products. You'd be looking also for Halo type products. So are there products that aren't just uh, similar copycats to the type of product that you're developing, but are there products that fit the same sort of consumer niche? So for example, if you're in the frozen, um, frozen confectionery or frozen novelty space, let's say ice cream sandwiches, you might be also looking at other ice cream desserts that could be um, filling in for that same sort of niche. You might also want to be looking at non-frozen desserts and thinking about what are the sort of events or the sort of lifestyles or the sort of people who'd be buying those products and make sure that those halo type products are also part of your consideration. In some cases, you want to take lots of photographs. Um, again, I, I hedge this by saying if you can. Some retailers are very, very concerned about uh, product developers and a competitive analysis going on within their uh, retail space. And I know many product developers who just go around sleuthing and you sort of get used to some quick techniques. Maybe you've got a, a grocery shopping list that you've preloaded into your phone so that if someone comes and asks you, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm taking a photograph and I'm, I'm sending it to my uh, sending it to my spouse to ask if this is the product that they actually want me to buy today. <laughs> Sometimes you have these little white lies so that you can carry on doing what you need to do. Um, and oftentimes you'll fill a grocery cart with other stuff so that it looks like you're not um, just dawdling around and, and doing competitive analysis. Do not get yourself in trouble. And if a grocery manager comes and says, uh, we're not sure about what you're doing, do be, uh, do be cooperative and leave. Um, also, uh, observe people shopping. Don't photograph them, please. That's a privacy issue, but do observe the people shopping. And if you're able to hover around and see um, what, sort of, what sort of behaviors, what sort of, what sort of personality, are they parents, are they older, are they uh, younger, are they, do they what, what, what sort of uh, cues can you pick up from people who are buying that product? If you can watch, if you can watch people in that space, for a short period of time, there's a lot of intel that you can be picked up from that as well. What else can you do? Oh, you can shop online. And this is fun because you can go to all sorts of uh, competitive retailer platforms and look and see what sort of offering they have. Now, what's interesting about online shopping, in some categories, there is fulfillment direct from the grocery retailer. And in other categories, it is the grocery retailer has the vendor platform, but the fulfillment goes through the, the vendor. Uh, Amazon's a great example of this, where there's um, fulfillment by Amazon or fulfillment by vendor. And you can uh, double check who is fulfilling that order. Uh, what it just means is that, um, does the retailer have a large warehouse that they are shipping from and they are compiling a singular order? Or are they uh, sending the order back to the individual vendors? And that's a really pe uh, interesting piece of intel right now. Some categories this works really well for, so dry goods, um, center of aisle grocery, stuff that's shelf stable, this works really great. But things that have short shelf life, it's typically fulfillment by the, uh, fulfillment by the retailer. And so what we're seeing more and more, especially in COVID, is that these grocery orders are fulfilled at um, local grocery stores, and then you're sent a, a point of pickup. The challenge is that the centralized websites often have the inventory for the entire system, and then, then you get substitution. But online shopping can be a lot of fun, and it, you can get a lot of uh, really great intel about uh, a lot of competitors really, really fast. You, you, you can also, um, using online 
observation, you can also take a look at some of the food service trends to understand where your product category may be evolving. So for example, if I'm doing ice cream sandwiches, I may be looking not just at the, the classic grocery retailers, but I could be going to ice cream parlors to see the styles of ice cream sandwiches that are very trendy. I could be looking at Instagram for ice cream sandwiches to see what sort of photographs and uh, cool presentations there are for ice cream sandwiches. Are people making them at home in interesting flavor combinations that are getting a lot of hits? Online is such a rich source of on, uh, information anymore, and I highly recommend this as part of your competitive analysis. Do take time to read labels, and I, and I can't stress this enough. Just from the front of label, what sort of personality does your product have? What sorts of health claims, traceabilities, origin protections are necessary for this, this category of product? So, for example, if I'm making ice cream sandwiches, um, am I noticing that all of my competitors are using kosher certification? If so, I may be really inclined to get kosher certification for my own product as well, even, um, even though... It may not necessarily be a product uh, that I'm targeting. It Because my competitors are feeling that it's important, there's a lot of intel that can be derived from that. Health claims, too. Like if, if we're seeing a lot of health claims in that space, is that a key opportunity that you need to, that you need to copy? Or is there a clear differentiator for not cluttering up the label and making it a really simple product? Um, in some cases, your demographic may want clean and simple rather than a whole lot of health claims. Ingredient declarations, honestly, I, I can't stress this enough and the students who study with me all the time know I love doing this activity where we look at the ingredient dec uh, we, the ingredient declaration and we go through each and so every single ingredient and I say, why is it there? Why is it there? What function does this contribute? What sort of um, regulatory limits are on this product? Because you can look at that ingredient declaration and in many cases, quickly reverse engineer the, the, the relative levels of different ingredients so that you can um, potentially take advantage of that technology yourself in formulating your own products. Do get data. So you can buy in classic marketing data. Uh, we've talked about getting in uh, marketing data from groups like Nielsen or Mintel or NPD. Um, there are all sorts of boutique marketing firms as well that can help you source um, search engine data or uh, internet-based um, information. You want to find out your price points, sales volumes, and sales cycles for your product. Uh, not all products sell uniformly across the year. If I'm selling ice cream sandwiches, my prime marketing time is going to be between May and September because that's the warm period of the year and people are more inclined to be eating ice cream sandwiches during the hot summer season. Ice cream uh, declines a bit in the winter period, but has a bit of a peak over holidays where it becomes uh, uh, easy to serve uh, family dessert when having family gatherings and having uh, a lot of eventing going on. Do invest in future forward methodology. So looking at social media comments, website reviews, search engine optimization, you do want to take advantage of all of the sort of data analytics that are possible through the internet. And um, there are marketing and advertising firms that specialize in tracking these sorts of information. And again, if you're a small business, you can do some of this legwork yourself too. There's nothing stopping you from going on to different competitors' websites and reading their public-facing reviews. And likewise, feeding, uh, reading the uh, comments back from the company. Oh, let's go and do one. So my friend Tiny, as, as you saw, he likes to make ice cream sandwiches. And so I just did one of these ice cream sandwich competitive analyses. I went to the grocery store and I took a look at some of the ice cream sandwiches. Something that I'm noticing, you will notice this is at a Food Basics. And the price point that we're seeing for ice cream novelties is ranging in the three, $3.99 per four units to um, $6.79 for six units. What else do we see? Oh, no, I didn't include an, another picture that I wanted to put in there, but I honed in on some of the ice cream sandwiches and found that in general for, uh, for the more premium ice cream sandwiches, we're looking at about a dollar to a dollar fifty per unit in a bulk box of typically four to six per unit. 
Now, some of the uh, discount brand ice cream sandwiches are going a bit lower, so you could see um, $4.99, $5.99 for a 12 pack, but it's a discount. It's a much cheaper in ice cream. It may not even be ice cream. It may be frozen uh, dairy dessert that doesn't meet the standard of identity for ice cream. And a lower price point on that product, but a much lower quality product. So when I'm thinking of my product, I'm in the premium ice cream sandwich. I'm looking at these sort of uh, ice cream novelties, um, drumstick cones, um, better ice cream on a stick sort of competitors in terms of uh, the replacements. I see Oreo sandwiches there too. So what else can I do? I'm going to step out to my webpage here because honestly I want to jump in and take a look. Here we go. We've got, uh, we can go into some of our competitors. Grocery shopping is going to help us identify who those competitors are. So maybe I'm looking in Loblaws. Here are all these different products that Loblaws has listed on their website. So no name ice cream sandwiches, 24 units, $8.99 on sale. But that, you can see it's a discount product. I can jump in here and on my quick view, I can do product details and quickly see it's available for delivery in store and in pickup. Product description, nutrition facts. It does contain ice cream, cream, modified milk ingredients, sugar, glucose, soy, mono, and diglycerides, carob. So it's got a lot of technical ingredients in there. They're not overly concerned about a clean label on this product. They want to have it at a low price point so that it's going to have nice, um, I said simple, but what, what I do know is, is part of the Simple Check program for No Name. And as such, it's um, supposedly got clean label. I don't know if I would agree with that clean label statement there, but according to them, they say this is a simple, simple list of ingredients. It's also got the Canadian dairy, it's got a kosher, and it's made in a peanut-free facility. Hey, guess what? Who's likely buying this product? Price point conscious parents who want a quick snack that they can hand out to kids in a very convenient format. So they can just hand their kid an ice cream sandwich and say, get out of here. <laughs> so. Um, that's fantastic. The, uh, a lot of intel that we were able to get there really quick. We can, if we want to compare right in here, view product details. This is, let's just compare, 24 no-name ice cream sandwiches. Something else I should know. What's the size of this sandwich? Quick view. Let me jump in here. So it is, what's the size of the sandwich? 24 by 120 mils. So each of them is 120 mils on that product. Let's jump back. It's interesting to see the price comparison here. It's $8.99 versus $6.49, but for 12. So on a per unit basis, it's about 150% uh, the price. The world's most popular flavor between chocolate wafer cookies. They look very similar, but this is a national brand. Natural color and flavor, peanut and nut free and dairy farmers of Canada, kosher symbol, same weight per unit, 12 at 120 mils. Let's jump into our, uh, interesting. You would almost think it's the exact same product. And what would be interesting, really, would be to print this out and do a side-by-side -side comparison. If this was the type of ice cream sandwich that we were trying to do a competitive analysis on. But let's jump, jump out and do one more quick look here. Oh, let's look at these ones, because these ones were a little bit more like the one that we saw our, our, our friend Tiny, the Playmobil dude. Um, he was hanging out eating an ice cream sandwich. Here we got... Let's see, I want to view the product details. So now it's a decadent cookie. It's a much smaller portion size, six at 100 mils. So we're pushing into that dollar per unit. Decadent cookies, as you know, are the classic normal, um, normal size cookie. They're not massive size.
So the cookie itself is now the first ingredient, which is interesting. Not the ice cream is the first ingredient. The cookie is the first ingredient. So by weight, it is contributing more. The ice cream, ironically, it looks like the same ice cream. It's got the same stabilizer blend in there. Glucose, sugar, mono, and diglyceride, carabine, gum, cellulose, guar, carrageenan. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it is the same ice cream base. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same co-backer that makes all three of them. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> the uh, some Something that you could quickly tell about uh, the co-packer. Um, oftentimes, co-packers will say, this is the box manufacturer that I need to work with. Or here are the glass bottles or the, the plastic containers that are capable of filling within our, our filling heads. You can see very uh, clear similarities between the box filling and the uh, label guns for putting on best before dates. These are the sorts of minor details that you can see quickly. I, 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 we could carry on doing that, but uh, something that's fun is take a look at the social media feeds. Uh, I've jumped into Facebook here and went into Chapman's Ice Cream and I'm just reading some of the consumer comments because you can quickly pick up on uh, what consumers are feeling. And they are saying that um, they find that this chocolate with chocolate flavor is too overpowering. They, you see comments about gluten-free ice cream and you can glean a lot of intel about uh, key opportunities for growth by reading some of those comments. Do go back to the actual manufacturer's web pages because you can find out more about their uh, branding and marketing statements about their uh, features and benefits that they're trying to uh, promote. And you can find out a lot about the uh, types of ingredients that they're willing to tolerate within their formulations. So I think that's it for doing some competitive analysis. You, it, it, what, what you would normally do is just line that all up because once you've lined it up, you are going to be able to do those sorts of uh, SWOT analyses, comparing the different products, or you can do some uh, sort of blue ocean value mapping. And we've done um, uh, slideshows talking about that earlier on in the semester. So take some time and do that competitive analysis. I wish, I wish, I wish I could take you to grocery shopping. We will have to grocery shop in our minds together, um, but have some fun doing this. And build out some charts of uh, comparing the different products against your product and make sure that you've got some clear differentiation why your product is worth positioning within the grocery store. I'll leave you with my friend, Dr. W. Edward Stemming. I never met him, but I feel like, I feel like we would have gotten on great if we met. And his quote for the day is, we must preserve the power of intrinsic motivation, dignity, cooperation, curiosity, joy in learning that people are born with. And competitive analysis is all about that curiosity and joy in learning. Just go have fun with this because honestly, it if you want to be in product development, this should be a joyful, exciting task to do. Have fun and we'll talk to you soon.